Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday News. Here's what we have in the bulletin. Seven shot, two fatally in Little Bay, West Maland. Picking up the pieces, the story of residents and business operators who were affected by last week's flooding. And later in sports, Court of Arbitration for Sport dismisses Jamaica's appeal to include a team in the two-woman bobsleigh event at the Winter Olympics in Beijing, China. I'm Krista Campbell and here are the details. Seven people were shot, two fatally, in Spring Garden, Westmoreland last night. The deceased have been identified as common-law couple Sharice Murray and 31-year-old Marshall Gale, otherwise called Cheese Tricks. The two are from Little Bay in Little London, Westmoreland. The incident happened minutes to nine on Sunday night. According to reports, they were the promoters of an illegal bike show in Spring Gardens. It's believed Ms. Murray and Mr. Gale were the targets of the attack. The police believe the attack was due to some misfortunes from lottery scamming activities. Meanwhile, the other injured persons remain hospitalized. The body of a man was found in St. Elizabeth last night. He's been identified as 26-year-old John I. Johnson, also known as Mad Milk. According to reports, about 9.30 p.m., a friend found Mr. Johnson's body at his house with chop wounds. No motive has been established for the killing. However, Mr. Johnson was out on bail on several charges. He had a case of murder before the Westmoreland Circuit Circuit Court. The St. Elizabeth Police had also charged him with illegal possession of firearm, robbery with aggravation, and rape. Classes have been suspended at the St. Andrew Preparatory School. This as counseling sessions are in progress for teachers and staff following the brutal murder of their colleague last Friday. Our reporter Sandra Williams visited the school this morning. As you would imagine, it is a very emotional time for the staff and students at the St. Andrew Preparatory School. When we arrived this morning, we were not allowed on the compound. I was told by the security that counseling sessions were in progress and that the school at some point in the day would issue a statement. I arrived sometime after 9 a.m. this morning and classes for today have been cancelled. Now up to the time of her death, Mrs. Phyllis Ramsey was a grade 6 teacher. She was appointed vice principal on August 1 last year. Her class would have been preparing for the upcoming PEP exams. For years, she has been preparing grade 6 students for the external exams. Now TVJ News understands that there will be counseling sessions for her students in the week. Now, Mrs. Ramsey and her husband, 69-year-old Cecil Ramsey, a minister of religion, were stabbed to death by their 22-year-old son, Simeon, last Friday. He remains in police custody. Now, the police said, based on the information they had received, Simeon appeared to have suffered from mental illness, which played out in the double murder. Reporting from St. Andrew Prep, for TVJ News, I'm Sandy Williams. Thanks, Sandy. Farmers in Portland are still picking up the pieces following major flooding in the parish last week. Cody and Barrett took the journey to Siemens Valley, Portland, and now reports. Flattened fields of banana crops and a few coconut trees hanging in the balance. Farmers in Siemens Valley spent months growing their crops, and in just two days, with no warning, flash flooding wiped out all they planted. I mean, I look for this. I mean, I really I look for this. Rainfall. And the water run might be one little, little drain come up and wash through and look apart. Nothing if you speak of because enough. Then time they no banana no banana and I'll drop down or the amount of debris, but now I tell you. Well this you cannot prepare for. You can't prepare for this cause you go to your bed and everything look alright and by daylight everything just gone. Cause river then come down bank to bank and just destroy everything. Farmers are now unaware of how to move forward. I set me back a couple months well, because you know banana take months to come. At least you now I have to get some fertilizer and stuff to push back these that here to see if I can get some more bearing. So basically it's gonna push me back like maybe around one, one five, six months. From from me happen me can't come like me can't even make a move. Can't make a move because I have to think if the rain will come down back again and do the same thing. Although some farmers were visited by a field officer from the Rural Agricultural Development Authority, RADA, last week, they are appealing for assistance. Well, I love to get some help. I don't know where I get it from, but I love to get some help. RADA, councillor, MP, anybody who can come on board and give me some help because I have to spend a lot of money to bring it back. Cody Ann Barrett, TVJ News.
Now, over in St. Mary, four days after flooding damaged homes and businesses, some of the people say they are yet to get any assistance from the government. TVJ News understands that relief operations have started, but some residents are losing patience. From Wednesday, we said they come up, so they give a mattress. So, who oh, in the middle of so? Once my dear get ten mattress, all when they have one room, once my dear get ten mattress. All who oh, in the middle of so, no get nothing, nothing at all, nothing. Only the Red Cross alone, Congilic a cleaning product. Only the Red Cross alone. I mean, I tell you, say, we get down here, so we get up. See, like how we get up now? We get up down here, so. And everything stop up there, so. I call, we have to call and run, go look our, I give away. It's rough. And the worst part of it, they are distributing things and it is not being done fairly. From the storm till now, at the first May, they try to hold on to go around and we can't go in. Even if we get a mattress, we don't know where to put it. Really? No, to be frank, it's full of mud, so. So you need assistance to, to clean your, your premises? Yes, sir. And everything in our mud, the mud, just pure mud. Now, some residents say they are still without a place to sleep. They want their political representatives and other agents of the state to intervene. We don't have no councillor for represent we down here. We don't have no MP. We don't have nobody, nobody at all for represent we. But when election time come, everybody are walking in a yard. Rainfall, water boot, sunshine, good, good shoes. No, no, it can't work, so It can't work, so We want help. No, we want bed. I have to send my grandson and my daughter got people yard go sleep. How long have you been washing? From Wednesday. Because the machine has been damaged. So <laughs> I have to go manual now. <laughs> All right. And it's time for a break here on the Midday News, but stay with us. More stories when we return. Welcome back to the Midday News. There has been a further decline in the number of people hospitalized due to COVID-19. According to the Ministry of Health, 392 people are now in hospital with the virus. 48 of the patients are severely ill, while 10 are critically ill. There are now 3,892 active COVID-19 cases on the island. 222 new, new cases were also reported in the last 24 hours from 2,427 samples. This brings the overall case count to 126,222. The positivity rate now stands at 24%. 9%. Four more people have died from the respiratory illness in Jamaica, increasing the death toll to 2,698. At the same time, 184 more people have recovered from the virus, pushing the recovery count to 71,623. Some advocates are this afternoon insisting that the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions ruling in the Enzinga King matter is taking too long. It's alleged that police cut Ms. King's hair while she was in custody. The matter was discussed on the morning agenda on Power 106. More in this report. 19-year-old Rastafarian Enzinga King is still awaiting the ruling of the Director of Public Prosecutions, DPP. Ms. King alleges that a woman cut her hair while she was in custody at the Fort Path Police Station in Clarendon last year. The latest from the office of the DPP is that the ruling is 95% complete, but Executive Director of Stand Up for Jamaica, Carla Gulota, believes it's taking too long. And the 95% of investigation have been done about what happened to the other five. Um, the case has been postponed again, and she will be again waiting for the justice system which is not answering to the needs of those which have been abused. Director of Programs and Advocacy at Equality for All, Glenroy Murray, wants more to be done to speed up the process. I think the state has to kind of recognize that there is a need to prioritize uh, these matters that concern the violations of the rights of its citizens or the alleged violations of the rights of its citizens by its officials. One of the arguments is that her hair was cut to prevent her from committing suicide. Ms. Kulota says that argument is inadequate. The story of the fact that Zinga locks were cut to avoid for her to commit suicide 
I think that most of the country has been laughing about it. I have locks, long locks, and I don't think I would be able to kill myself with them. So at least, at least, let's try to avoid the outrage to take people as fool because it's something like that is it's a poor self-defense. Jamila Midland, TVJ. A group of young men in Manchester are now on their way to entrepreneurship after receiving assistance from a non-profit organization. Cody and Barrett has their story. It's an exciting beginning for 10 young men in Manchester who were awarded certificates and grants to either grow or start their own business. Through a partnership with the Young Men of Purpose organization and the Community Safety and Security branch of the JCF, a Youth Reap project was launched last year. Over the weekend, some of those men who participated in the program completed their training. The young men were also, they also had the opportunity to pitch their businesses and 10 young men received business grants of over 550,000 Jamaican dollars to grow and even to start their businesses for those who did not start. They also participated in various workshops in areas related to health and wellness, violence and abuse, as well as prevention and management. Two of the recipients spoke with TVJ News about the impact of the program and how the grants they received will help. I shift my life into a positive outlook in finding something to do with my time and kind of helping me it coping skills in life. Through the different sessions that we have, the training about health, wellness, the whole operation of the business model and all of that, I learned so much from it that I could have taken back to the business that at the end of the program, the funding for me was really a bonus because all that knowledge was priceless. According to Ms. Roden, the communities of Greenvale, Richmond and George's Valley in Manchester were the focus for the program. Now in Manchester, we are aware that these three communities have been prone to youth crime and violence. And so we wanted to go into the communities and to select young men who have been directly impacted by, you know, violence or violent activities in their communities. We want to ensure that we were equipping them to be agents of change in their families and also in their communities. Cody and Barrett, TVJ News. And it's now time for the Business Minute. Here's Cody and Barrett. In the world of business, NCB Financial Group is in the spotlight after again avoiding to pay dividends despite its earnings falling short of prior periods. Its chairman, Michael Lee Chin, has assured that NCB will alight from this dividend hiatus. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, NCB Financial was a faithful distributor of dividends, paying out a record $8.3 billion in 2019. But amid the health crisis, large financial institutions were told to safeguard their cash in case of emergency. NCB Financial put a pause on dividends that were usually paid quarterly and since then has made only one distribution totaling $1.2 billion or 50 cents per share. A bill to support debt relief for Caribbean and other developing countries was passed in the U.S. House of Representatives on Friday. The legislation, among other things, places a moratorium on debt payments. The World Bank has warned of a 12% increase in the debt burden of developing countries to a record 860 billion US dollars in light of the pandemic. Since its debt service suspension initiative took effect in May 2020, it has delivered 10.3 billion US dollars in relief to more than 40 countries. And that's it for the Business Minute. I'm Cody Ann Barrett. Time now for the top regional and international stories with Sandy Williams. In the region, in Haiti, the government has cancelled Carnival this year due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic that has killed 804 people and infected 29,715 others over a two-year period. In a statement, the Ministry of Culture said that while the pandemic had a major factor in taking the decision to cancel the national celebrations, economic issues as well as overall security in the French-speaking CARICOM country had also contributed to the decision. On the international scene, Australia has announced the reopening of its borders to vaccinated tourists and other visa holders for the first time in almost two years. The reopening will take effect on February 21. 
In March 2020, the government closed the borders. It barred most foreigners from entering the country and put caps on total arrivals to help combat COVID-19. And those were the top regional and international stories. I'm Sandy Williams. We head to a quick break now. When we return, Renardo Brown will have your midday sports report. Welcome back. It's now time for your midday sports. Sports highest global court has dismissed an appeal from Jamaica's Jasmine Fenletta Victorian asking to be included in the Beijing Olympics two-woman bobsleigh competition after she alleged Jamaica had been unfairly excluded. Jamaica missed qualifying for the last spot at the Games for the two-woman event in a tiebreaker with France. In her appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sport Cats, Fenletta Victorian had alleged that the International Bobsleigh and Skeleton Federation, the IBSF, broke its own rules in calculating points that determine Olympic spots in the sport. Fenletta Victorian accused the body of duplicating the results from a race in the German resort town of Winterberg on December 5 by publishing the same results from a day earlier. This meant that competitors in the duplicated race earned points uh, putting a French doubles team ahead of Fenletta Victorian and teammate Audra Sigri. I am not clear on the legal basis for the dismissal, but the decision has come down as dismissed. We accept that wholeheartedly. Uh, winning is one thing, uh, but the more important thing is to speak up. And I'm very proud of Jasmine for, for, for speaking up. Uh, we maintain that it is better that sport results be determined on the field of play and not in administration. Uh, we put that behind us. We are now in a high perform performance zone and um, we're getting ready for competition. Now, Cass announced it had dismissed the application, saying the full reasons would follow. Football now as defending champions Cavalier will look to break a run of two straight defeats when they take on Humble Lion in one of two games in the Jamaica Premier League today at the Captain Hurstborough Centre of Excellence. Since their opening day 2-1 win over Arnett Gardens, Cavalier have suffered defeats against Waterhouse and Portmore United failing to score in both games. They will take on a Humble Lion team who are yet to taste the victory this season, having two drawn results and one defeat so far. In their meeting last season, Cavalier came away 2-0 winners at the same venue. The game is set to kick off at 1 p.m. And at 3.15, Malines United, the only team apart from Humble Lion yet to win a game this season, will be hoping to hand new coach Garnet Lawrence his first three points when they take on third place Don Beholden FC. Since their 2-2 draw with Harborview in their opening game, Malines have lost 1-0 and 4-1 to Veer United and Montego Bay United respectively. And they are currently at the foot of the table on one point and will once again find Dumbo holding hard to beat. In fact, in their previous three meetings, Malines are yet to get a point against their rivals, with all three games producing four or more goals between the two sides. And finally, England have appointed Paul Collingwood as interim head coach for their three-test tour of the West Indies starting next month. The appointment comes after former head coach Chris Silverwood and managing director Ashley Giles were both sacked last week following England's 4-0 Ashes defeat to Australia. Former England all-rounder Collingwood was assistant coach under Silverwood and took charge of last month's 3-2 T20 series defeat in the West Indies. Collingwood's appointment follows Sir Andrew Strauss taking up the position of interim managing director with a res reset of England's red ball cricket setup demanded after just one win in their last 14 test matches. Strauss confirmed last week Joe Root would remain as test captain while England's squad for the West Indies tour, which gets underway on March 1, is set to be named on Tuesday. And uh, that's it for your Midday Sports Report. Krista, it's back to you. Thanks, Renardo. Now, despite the slight setback you mentioned with our two-man squad, exi exciting days ahead for our, our Winter um, Olympics team, right? Yeah. Um, of course, Jasmine Fenletta Victorian in the monobob will be the first time she's competing at the Olympic Games. In that event, the two-woman bobsled team missed out on a spot. They wanted to get in, but too bad. And, of course, I really want to see Alexander in the alpine skiing event. Mm -hmm. And the men's bobsled, two-man, four-man, should be amazing stuff. All right, looking forward. And that's the Midday News. I'm Krista Campbell. Join us again at 7 for Primetime News. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, have a good afternoon.